Okay, this is try number three. I've got bothered by people interrupting me when I'm making my video. And now I'm going to talk about corporate finance in this video. And not advanced valuation. I'm going to talk about valuation and I'm going to talk about this value driver formula. But I'm going to talk about how this value driver formula is applied and so you go to corporate finance and then A to Z, step by step, corporate model, blah, blah, blah. And then I have all these parts of the corporate model, this overview. I really should go into why it's so difficult to really apply multiples sometimes in this, in, in valuation. How to get, get uh, data, how to compute the... ROIC, which is not difficult, but kind of what you should do and structure it, structuring the assumptions with a historic switch, making a model structure that goes through all the cash flows and the working capital and the taxes and blah, 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 and down to a balance sheet. And then I also have something where we convert a standalone model into an acquisition model. But this one, I, I want to talk about valuing, structuring valuation in a model. Now, for all of these uh, series, whatever, I don't know what to call them, I have kind of an Excel file with completed, an Excel file with an exercise. This leaves some blanks. And then this exercise, in this file with the, the, the exercise, I have a, uh, and I'm just trying to introduce things really here. Ah, well, I better put it in here. Okay. And, and then uh, what I have in these ones is, and in the, you, you basically fill in the blanks. Now I have something else open. Excuse me for that. This is this construction. With them. Okay. Now the, the, uh, okay. Uh -huh. oh, Jesus. Okay, and what we're going to do, I'm going to have you fill in the blanks. Now, in uh, as you go through this model, there's the you you start with the uh, historic financial statements, and they're all separate. You keep. I hope you keep those separate, and then you compute some returns. You make some assumptions. You go through the work through the model. That's all in other uh, videos and in other pages. And then we get down to the valuation. Now, I did something that's arguably kind of bad. I put some uh, uh, assumptions for valuation up here. So I said we could start at different dates, end at different dates. And that's up here. We're going to have a start date and an end date. And then we'll have put some weighted average cost of capital and some terminal growth and different methods. And then there'll be a big issue with how to adjust the, the capex to depreciation to get a normalized value for the capex to depreciation. Now, I address that a lot elsewhere, but I'll use a user-defined function to get there. So I've just left some blanks. And then we'll compute the... PV of the uh, cash flows, and then I want to show you how to do some of this normalization for working capital and for CapEx, and finally get a terminal value, and then we'll get a terminal value using a growth rate method, and then we're going to try to use this value driver method f uh, formula, which I criticize, which you really should adjust for inflation here. Well, in this case, you don't have to adjust for inflation. I take that back. Uh, and then we'll uh, compute it two different ways. We're going to compute this value driver two different ways. And then I uh, will have a third method where we... I need to step back. The method number one just says we'll use this kind of McKinsey method. Method number two says as soon as you hit the terminal value, we're going to 
adjust the return on invested capital to a normalized level. So there's no interpolation. There's no gradual change. It's immediate. And in the third method, this black box McKinsey thing we're not going to use, and this immediate change we won't use, but we'll interpolate the return on invested capital and get down to a, a, a gradually get down to the uh, uh, equilibrium level. Now, when you really think about companies, ugh, think about a lot of these companies like Toys R Us, you know, that company it just went bankrupt. And you think about, oh, God knows who else, Kodak, I don't know. I'm trying to think of other companies. What happens really in the terminal year? Do you really reach a stable value or do you just eventually go bankrupt? I don't know. Okay, and GE, oh my God. Well, I guess they, they're down to a low end. It's okay, it's stupid, okay, it's okay. Oh, these interruptions that I get when I'm trying to make a video, they're so ah, irritating, and what am I supposed to do? Okay, and now I have to get back to thinking of, of how I'm going. Now, the final step, what we're going to do is address this bridge between the enterprise value and the equity value and talk about how you would uh, make adjustments for the book value and the market value and incorporate these kind of things in your model and ultimately you can uh, uh, kind of show what's going on so here we have a roic forecast that's down at about I don't know, 10%. Now, I think to adjust this, it might be it might be worthwhile to put a couple of spinner boxes around here and make the whack go up and down and uh, show you some alternative valuation methods and show you what's really going to happen to these issues. I'm not going to waste your time, I promise, with silly spinner boxes. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, before I start this, there was there's another file that this one's uh, this one has a quarterly model. The reason I put a quarterly model together was more because of uh, uh, acquisition issues. Because if we want to acquire the company, we, we might want to do this on a, some kind of quarterly or monthly basis. All right, so I have a picture of an acquisition here. And this is the uh, same model that I made an earlier video about uh, discussing acquisition. Now, on this model, uh, I kind of completed the summary. And you can see, in this case, the return on invested capital was pretty high. Now, if we put a lower uh, return... Oops! This is not my circular reference. It's from another sheet that I'm trying to fix. That's what's making this stupid thing so slow. These damn circular references. Okay, I have not put the interpolated method here. And um, I wanted to really show you that when we have these two different McKinsey, this is this McKinsey driver, formula it gives a ev to ebitda ratio of about eight if we immediately change from this thing which is i don't know 17 percent and we immediately go from nine plus four is i think that's 13 percent so we're in this case immediately going to 13 percent if the growth rate is low which this is a totally bad growth rate, by the way. The growth rate and the WAC and the uh, uh, rest of the model should be consistent. If this is really low, basically what this method happens, you can go to what happens with this method is that the, you never get to this low return. So this is where you, you, you never get to the declining that's why this is so much higher now what we're trying to do is explicitly have the roi go down we should even make a graph of the three methods i think that's what we'll do one is you don't know what's happening and in another method it 
just goes down immediately. And in the third method, it gradually goes down. That's what I mean by this interpolated method. And we'll use the interpolate function. Now, before I go through this, let's just talk about valuation ideas and crimes, because some people have made a very good suggestion to me. They said, put your thoughts down, put some points down. So before you get into all the, expe all the expe Excel, <laughs> I can't even pronounce it, talk about the basics. And the number one, one of the uh, 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 basics is to understand that this idea behind all these valuation methods that some company is going to achieve some sort of stable equilibrium is a lot of bullshit. So I don't know what to say about that. It's about the only assumption you can make. Otherwise, you're going to make an assumption that the company just grows and takes over the economy or that it all just goes bankrupt. Eh, maybe the second one is closer. Then uh, you should apply a half-year convention to all these valuations or a half-period convention. And that's because if you don't, you're assuming all the cash flows and everything occurs at the end of the year or the beginning of the year. The middle of the year is the only reasonable, or period is the only reasonable. And then use switches. I've already shown you that so that you can start with different uh, valuation periods end with different valuation periods. Hopefully, it doesn't make that much of a difference, especially the ending point. And then you should understand that this wide range of uh, valuations that comes from WAC, again, these are all fundamental ideas, uh, that's supposed to happen because very small differences in the rate of return you earn have a gigantic difference on the amount of money you actually get. Uh, this is why all of this Damaradan stuff is such crap to say, oh, we know the, the, the biggest farce in all of financing, finance is that the equity market risk premium can be something like 4 or 5 or 6 or 7 percent. What a ridiculous thing. That would create revolution. That would destroy capitalism because investors would get so rich and everybody else would get so poor. Okay, and then here, don't, I remember, these are things people ask. Oh, some people say, oh, too much of the value comes from terminal value. What bullshit is that? Of course it's going to come from terminal value. It's like you're buying and selling a stock, Google stock. Who I don't think they pay a dividend. You, 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 your idea is that stock price is going to go up. That's a terminal value. It all comes from terminal value, not this piddly little intermediate cash flow. Now, if you have a model where a ROIC makes sense to compute for a company, and that does not apply to all companies, it certainly does not. Some companies have ridiculous ROICs. Or if you're in the service business, you know, or if software business, ROIC might be an absurd number to really compute. But if you can compute it, and if it's reasonable, that's the number you should use to check your model. And you should present that right next to the valuation. Now, when you change your growth rate, and you're using a growth rate, uh, uh, you're using a terminal growth model, and especially when the ROIC fails, that's the kind of model you should use. You should make sure that the rest of your assumptions are consistent, in particular working capital and CapEx. So if you have higher terminal growth, you're going to have to spend more money to get the EBITDA. I've said that too many times. If you have higher terminal growth, you're going to have to spend more work and capital investment to get that growth. If it's lower growth, it's less. When you change the terminal growth, the cash flow should change. And so when you have a terminal growth rate at the end, that should define what kind of investment you need to achieve that growth rate. It's so basic, but so few people do it. Okay, if you have the bridge between enterprise value and equity value, net debt, but net debt includes anything that's not in EBITDA, any, any kind of asset or liability that's not in EBITDA, that net debt should be at market value. That's a pretty obvious one. Everybody at least agrees with that. The, this is the whack should be computed with net debt. Nobody ever does that because it's correct. It's correct. And my friend says, you can't disprove all the financing in a 30 minute video. Bullshit. Yes, you can. Sorry. Okay. And then 
you, when you throw in multiples, you've got to understand that if you have a lower growth rate, it should have a lower multiple. If you have a safer company, it should have a higher multiple. You can't just apply multiples from other companies, although everybody does that. And you can't, if you, you, this is one of the great myths of financing to pretend that multiples are all stable across time or across companies in an industry. What a bunch of crap. Now let's get into a little more advanced things. When you're using the multiples, you should put the ROIC in you. When you say, here's the multiple for this company, that company, that company, the thing that really drives it is a change in return and a growth rate. So if you have different multiples, you should put the growth rates and the ROIC right next to those multiples to understand what's driving them. Okay, and you should really understand what's in, I'm reading this obviously, what's in free cash flow and what's in terminal value, uh, uh, enterprise e equity value to enterprise value bridge. And a big deal that's in there is Think about deferred taxes. Should that be a liability? Accountants call that a, a liability. They also call accounts payable a liability. They also call provisions for warranties a liability. Well, accounts payable, when we do our valuation, we don't call it a liability. We actually, the more you increase accounts payable, the more your cash flow goes up because your EBITDA, which is your starting point, is... Uh, uh, less than the cash flow because you're delaying payments to all your employees and you're getting money for that. And that's increasing value. It's not a liability. It's deferred taxes and uh, at least deferred taxes related to operations, not deferred taxes related to things like, uh, uh, what, what, what are those things like uh, uh, fair value of derivatives or uh, financing or something else. If deferred taxes related to the pure operations of the company if you have more deferred taxes and they're ongoing more deferred taxes, that increases value because the government's giving you a tax break. And when you compute the taxes for your on your EBITDA or for your free cash flow, that tax rate doesn't incorporate the deferred taxes. Deferred taxes should increase value. They should be a increase, an increase in deferred taxes at least should increase value. Now, there are exceptions for things like net operating loss, which could run out, and it's not a forever kind of thing. So these are not easy things. This is an intermediate thing. And I've got in other videos. You should understand that when you have an ROIC, it's a horrible, it's the, the only kind of good statistic you can do, could get in a model to really benchmark your model, but it can be so distorted by write-off sales of assets, a zillion other things. Okay. And if you're going to have stock options to management, which seems to be a trend in things like uh, IT companies, well, those stock options should be, that's just another form of an employee compensation. And you've got to adjust your models and your valuations eventually to kind of put those, the amount of payment you get in stock options as part of the free cash flow. Using just diluted shares just doesn't work very well. Okay, and then you should uh, uh, adjust the, I'm reading this now because I can't remember what, what it is, but the growth rate and the WAC should all be consistent. If you, I, I already said that above, but if you have a higher growth rate, you need higher CapEx. Also, if you have a higher growth rate, if you have a, a, a nominal uh, uh, weighted average cost of capital that's high, well, that means inflation is high basically, and then the growth rate should be higher. You can't make them inconsistent. It's amazing how crap. If you're, uh, uh, if you're doing re-leveraging and unleveraging, you should affect, uh, uh, be very, very careful with the debt beta and use credit spreads to get the debt, debt beta. Now, the advanced things, which I'm going to cover, they, I, I'm, I'm going to suggest and I've already introduced it, this is really kind of advanced, that make a ROIC calculation that has a little interpolation. Don't believe this bullshit uh, McKinsey stuff, okay? If you're doing a fancy cost of capital, why don't you try this market-to-book ratio regression? Really try it. 
Do something better than the old Cap M, which has so many implicit assumptions that it's just like uh, uh, buying a, 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 a Talib said. It's just like buying a, a potion on the internet. I couldn't find his quote even. Well, I'll have to get it. I couldn't find it on the internet. I'm going to get it from a book. Okay, and incorporate the correct tax shield in the WAC. Okay, if you're going to really uh, uh, understand multiples, understand that the EV to EBITDA is affected very importantly by the depreciation rate and the real economic life of a a a assets. Okay, and if you really do this growth rate thing fancy, you should adjust for the historic, this this capex to depreciation so let me now go to the let's let's go and just fill in some of these so if you remember i put in this is the uh, uh, model kind of the going through some of the more fundamental issues and one of the things i said is use a use the switches so when this is greater than whoops greater than or equal to this and of course you press a four and if you're real fancy and you don't press f3 you press f4 you press it a couple times and then you go up to that and make it less than or equal to the to the terminal period okay and i <laughs> i can't seem to find the f4 and i did it oh shit oh god this number you all start with this was is greater than or equal to i'm just going to press an f4 and this number is less than or equal to this number i've put the historic switch in there okay and if you don't mind i need to get rid of a couple of all right i'm back i hope that improves things now uh if you just take this one and make it equal to the terminal value switch okay then we can press shift control r as long as the uh, generic macros are open okay and that just takes it to the end so we can put a flexible time period to start and stop our valuation okay that's the first thing we did now the next thing this is all the historic stuff i'm going through that again i guess i don't feel badly for doing that there are all the assumptions with the blue little things they should be arranged a little more diff in a, in a separate sheet but when i went through this we just kind of wanted to get this model finished quickly okay then now if you want to get the capex to depreciation that's a function of the growth rate and the depreciation life you can put equal capex now i in uh, well i'm kind of lying a little bit in in another um okay do i not have this function just a minute Okay, so we want to get the capex to depreciation consistent with the life and the growth rate. So if we change the growth rate and life, we get a different number. Now to do that, you can go, I hope, let's see if this works. You go to the website, you, you uh, get the, the function that gives you this is just a function and there's i got some other videos somewhere on this this is a function that gives you the stable capital expenditures to depreciation so you can go to your model and then you can press alternate and f8 all right and then you can take one of these let's take let's see what we have in this one who knows this is 
probably some complete crap uh, and then you can paste it now you don't need two option bases one this is for array counting and then once you have that you can go and put equal cap x to depreciation and then you press shift f3 and it says get the life of the assets and then it says uh, and then get the growth rate which is the terminal growth rate and then you don't need a timing code so this says if the growth rate let's put it a zero growth rate if the zero if you have a zero growth rate the capex to depreciation if you have a 10 percent growth rate you need a whole bunch of capex if you have three you have that now if the lifetime is one then it's it's just you need it's almost like you need only the three percent you you just blah 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 if you the uh, life is 20 then because it's you're filling it in and taking it out filling it in taking it out and as you're growing you're you, as you're growing you're putting more in faster than you're taking out so this ratio uh, 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 changes a lot okay so that you need to do that first now once you have the free cash flow which is EBITDA minus working capital again I added back changes and provisions that's this whole thing with deferred taxes and all that you put a little if statement and you say if the, it's the explicit switch then you take the number and then you don't put anything on the false for this you don't put anything on the false and the reason this is so important and you love this so much is that then it just goes tr true and this false is not zero false is not zero i have to say it five times false is not zero because if it was zero it would take the npv back to all this way and now you have a flexible method and this npv if you just click on the rate and the whole line it only starts after the false so you've got a flexible method and then to get the half year assumption or this you take the this thing and you multiply it by one plus the weighted average cost of capital and you can raise it to the power so i suppose you could assume it doesn't occur right in the middle okay and we have a negative value for the explicit period i couldn't care less about that here's why you couldn't care less because they maybe you've got some high cap x high growth it's really the terminal value that drives everything okay so then you uh, uh the first thing is we're going to need the depreciation and the operating taxes uh to get our our uh, return on invested capital but let's make a couple of valuations first in the first one let's just use the classic oh no 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 god first let's make an adjustment to the to the working capital because let's say that the terminal growth rate goes down to one percent what you want to make sure is that the working capital investment that's here which is an actual number based on the, the hi history this working capital adjustment which in fact there was a negative number don't worry about that uh is not going to be correct because if we if we if we have a negative two percent growth for example this number doesn't change but in the long run you're going to have to make less working capital investment so that's the first kind of thing you do to make a stable uh, a, a stable analysis okay so to get this you take the working capital uh, uh, and divide this is the working capital to EBITDA and you take that number which is up here that 3.52 is working capital to EBITDA and then you multiply that by the growth rate so if we have a lower growth rate we have a lower increase in working capital and then you have to also multiply it back by the EBITDA okay and then you divide that whole thing by one plus the growth rate now it's entirely possible that you can come up with an easier method to do this and other people just make an extra one year forecast at the terminal growth rate i don't know maybe that's okay okay so there's our uh, uh and then 
uh, I'm just going to take this one and multiply it by the uh, terminal switch. Okay, just to illustrate how that works. You know, I, I, I don't know if I really had to do that. Okay, so there's our terminal growth, which compares to our working capital. Pretend that's positive. It doesn't matter. Okay, so if you have a different growth rate, you'll have a different number. If we make the terminal period 20%, Okay, you say, oh, you'd never do that. Well, of course you wouldn't. But I'm just illustrating that, that, that now we have a different stable period working uh, capital adjustment. Okay, now that's, so that's the first adjustment. The second adjustment is this whole business with the, the stable ratio of capex to depreciation, which is this 1.1. That's the stable amount with the working. So what you do is you take the depreciation expense, which should be a stable kind of number because it reflects all the history of the company. And you're going to take that number, which, ex which reflected all the historic kind of expenditures you made, and you're going to multiply that by this stable, uh, uh, this, this factor. Okay. And then you, you, you can get the regular old cash flow. This is two, uh, 421. That's this regular old cash flow up here. But then we can get the, uh, uh, the normalized cash flow, which we take away the original working capital we had and we add back the, the uh, stable working capital and blah, blah, blah. Take away the original CapEx, add back the uh, uh, new ones we have. Okay, now. If you put in, let's put in a growth rate. So uh, over here, we should put in our, uh, our terminal growth rate. Okay, and then uh, that's just the growth rate. And I think we should put in up here. I'm going to do this a little differently. So if we take one plus the growth rate and divide that by the WAC minus the growth rate, that's our method number one. And if you have a company that has a crazy ROIC and you can't figure out any comparative multiples for that company, that still basically the only way to do it to do make the valuation okay and you can kind of stop here and so that's our that that's our multiple a growth rate i'll call it multiple of cash flow that's what we're going to multiply the terminal value uh, to get now if we get our terminal value we're going to take this one and multiply it by our stable period or normalized cash flow but when we do that we better multiply it by the terminal switch now if you do that it's not correct because the npv the valuation will oh we've got a negative value here shit oh well uh the negative value will be uh, applied to the oh God, up here so what you need to do is right up here you put a little if statement and go up to the explicit switch not the terminal switch because we want to take the npv just until we get to that explicit switch now just a minute okay so i uh changed a couple of assumptions and then we take the npv just like we did before and if you, I suppose we could even uh, put our discount, our, our uh, weighted average cost of capital here that should have been correctly adjusted for the net of tax uh, um, the net of tax uh, debt. That's our, that's our terminal PV. And if we're a little bit more precise, we should multiply this by one not a little bit if we're more precise it's absolutely something we should do raised to the 0.5 power okay and the half year 
uh, convention goes into everything. Now we can do the same sort of thing. So over here I did the same sort of thing. And this just says take the EV to EBITDA ratio. And if it's the explicit pit switch, then turn it on, use that on and off, and just take the final year EV to EBITDA ratio, and we get a, a very different. Okay, now it's been a couple of days since I made, well, maybe even longer, since I started this video. It's taken me forever, and I hate it, and I just got a phone call, and the man said, well, what's the matter? You sound like you're half dead. I'll try to be a little more enthusiastic. And what I did is obviously I changed the colors. I thought the true and false were getting a little bit overboard. Now, we have gone through, let me go through some theory before I start the mechanics of working through these value driver formulas. And I have three alternative uh, uh, value driver analyses. In the first... Uh, uh, Recall, one of the big deals in the, the uh, growth rate formula is if you make a small change in the growth rate, okay, there, I think you're getting a really big uh, difference in the valuation. And, and if the WAC is close to the growth rate and if I'm making a small change in the WAC, look at how my terminal value is massively changing now i guess i don't have to cheat for just a minute don't ever do this but if i put a seven times every dot or better yet if i just change the whack a little bit here uh oh, come on if i make it a little higher notice that this method go, went down by what was it used to be that was half a percent two thousand 400 down to 2,141, 2,453. When I do the same thing on the terminal value with, with the EV to EBITDA, we get a much smaller uh, range. Okay? Uh, that's kind of enough, and I'm not going to make a data table or anything else to, to illustrate that. And that's why people might say, let's use this. EV to EBITDA method, but, oh, God, it sucks. It doesn't suck because of all the academic reasons. It sucks because the nobody has a clue as to what the EV to EBITDA is. This isn't the same across companies. It's not the same for one company across time. And if you change, of course, I will get a little academic here. If you change the growth rate and the, the return and all the, the cost of capital, it changes dramatically. So you can't say that it's a nice, easy number to find. That's bullshit. Okay. I got, I'm getting awake now. Now, Here's what I want to show you as an alternative. Now you get really fancy and you read your McKinsey book and they say use the value driver formula. And here it is. And what you do on this one mechanically is this is the multiple of no pet. So you take one minus the uh, a G divided by ROIC. Oops. One minus. I'm going to use F for G divided by ROIC, close the bracket, and divide that by the WAC, oops, divide that by the WAC minus the growth rate. And that gives you, <laughs> oops, I didn't put a bracket around there. Okay, and that gives you your, the amount you're going to multiply that, 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 thing gets multiplied by no plat so you find no plat pat whatever the hell they call it. it that's just ebit minus taxes and we already computed operating taxes so that's just this one shift control r okay and then just like i showed you earlier two weeks ago or whenever i did this at first we need a a little true false on the explicit period so when it's true then you're going to multiply this by this uh, but multiply it also by the terminal switch and that creates a little series where we have zeros at the beginning 
and then we go all the way to the start and then we multiply the whole thing by one plus the the whack raised to the power of 0.5 okay and that's the half year convention and that's our terminal value now here's some of the things about that if i increase the roic by a little bit it's well here it wasn't as dramatic as you might think but it's pretty big okay let's let's make it two percent that makes it two percent above the whack now if i increase my growth rate that has a pretty dramatic effect just like the uh, uh before but 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 if the roic is equal to the WAC, and you make this kind of silly assumption which is that the company will just stop doing anything then just by virtue of the mathematics the growth rate doesn't matter so some people do this almost to 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 to, to make their growth rate not matter which is kind of an idiotic thing to do if you would be less if the roic is less than the WAC, and we increase the growth rate then the value goes down this has got all the fundamental theories of it in okay nothing special there all right and now let's go to the second method now and before i i go through any mechanics uh, the second method and this is not mechanics this is the theory that's our basic formula for for our uh, 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 value driver but you can take this no pat and this no pat is invested capital times roic now i said existing roic for this one above but this could be by the new roic so what you could do is first compute the invested capital then put the roic in but the stable roic then put the the uh, multiply these two things together and then get the multiplier and then do all your analysis so i just went through the mechanics even though i didn't said i wouldn't kind of but uh this it gives you a very different answer than this one in this one it implicitly assumes that you don't hit this roic immediately there's an implicit assumption that this goes down gradually and i've wasted a whole lot of time trying to figure out for myself what that really really means but in this method you can see if we fall immediately to the whack then uh, uh at the whack the roic falls immediately to 7.5 percent then you get a lot lower number now i didn't tell you something but the whack at the terminal date the whack the roic get this right you idiot the roic at the terminal year is 10 percent okay now if i would put something like 10 percent here and i i can't really i'll put uh, i'll put 10.5 how's that and in that case this even gives you a higher value and the reason it gives you a higher value is because you're now you're gradually instead of going uh, uh, down you're gradually going up and if we immediately go up we get a higher value if this was 9.5 percent where the existing roic is is 10 you get a lower value okay i hope that instead of just working through all this mechanics we can do things differently now i hate everything about this McKinsey stupid crap because there's not this is a black box who knows how fast this 10 percent is going down to 7.5 or let's make it go down to 6.5 and so what we can do here in this last method now I put the result of this last method the result is kind of at the bottom and it takes a few extra lines to get there okay and in this method instead of using a black box i kind of use this immediate thing and say in some year let's put 2040. so we go from 2026 and we have a 10 percent roic and gradually it goes down to 6.5 because of whatever your equilibrium assumptions or whatever you could even assume if you want that the company basically goes bankrupt almost and then see what the value is in this case we get a negative value 
in this case it's a little bit positive value in this case it's negative okay or maybe it doesn't go quite down that far it goes down to three and a half percent and it goes down in 2000 by the time you get to 2060 and you still get a positive value in this case actually in this case it's not that much different whatever okay now up oh, i went too high let's have it go down to to uh, six and a half percent now in this method which is summarized here we have an interpolation we have a roic uh, which i'll get into the interpolate command not a lot but it starts right in the terminal year at 10 percent and gradually goes down to your stable equilibrium and then you can see well what is in fact this black mckinsey box assumption what kind of assumption are they really making when they apply this formula what are they assuming about how long it takes to get down to this new level and you can see in this case it's more than what 60 minus 26 i don't know 35 years or whatever 34 years and i didn't maybe i should have gone past 2060 because we never kind of get to the result and if we go go to 2027 then you're almost the same as this number and if it's 2030 it's almost the same again okay and if we put it now let's put a let's even kind of be a little a thing where we put the whack and this together we get this this time you get 2109 this time you get 1202 and if you go to 2060 then you get 17 and this time if i change the growth rate let's make the growth rate much higher then you get a different number in fact okay we i had one that looked very similar it wasn't exactly here okay and this one instead of this wonderful formula that works as long if, if this ric here is the same as this ric here everything is totally fine but this implicit uh, speed at which you get to the new ric is not anywhere kind of explained and when you do it not explained but whatever yeah it doesn't the, the formula doesn't certainly kind of have it so let's show you so this is a method where we put a explicit time frame for the roic going down and of course you don't know what it's going to be how the hell do you know that okay but at least we have something better than this unknown and this crazy kind of assuming it immediately suddenly whoop 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 gets to a level that's really low maybe that's okay maybe that's reasonable but you can apply this method then and, and put the same kind of thing here you can just put a shorter year here. okay so nobody's ever going to do this maybe you're going to shut off the video and okay if you shut it off now i'd be really happy if you shut it off a little before the theory i'd be crying but whatever nobody listens to me anyway not a teacher at some big fancy school or anything like that so here's what you first do is you put a post explicit period that's this period when we're going to start from our 10 percent start down to this and so we need to somewhere define that we're going to stop in 2050. so you got to put all these extra years and you know you use the eis and all that stuff to alt eis i think uh, uh well it would have been better in fact to just uh, I copy this across alt eis was a bad thing to use whatever because you might change the dates later maybe okay so that's our first period and then you say the valuation period and that's the very end now between 2027 and 2050 uh actually 2020 yes 2027 we're going to compute and we're going to have to get some cash flow you have while you grow while the company grows 
and we're also going to have to put an NPV in. And when we NPV the, the terminal value and the cash flows in between, we're going to have to start at the explicit period switch, not at the beginning. So you put a little or statement. Either it's the extended time or it's the explicit period switch. And then we need a growth rate. Okay. Now, once we have all of that, um, uh, 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 let's go all the way to the end so you can kind of see how these switches work. So then we have a zero uh, as, as normal. Uh, and then after the explicit period, we have nothing. These are all in the explicit period. We get our normal cash flows in the explicit period. I hope I have that right. And then after the explicit period, you get your cash flows from just kind of growing and the ROIC gradually going down. And then at the very end, you sell the company just like you did before. But this time we have an explicit gradual decline. Okay, so that's why we needed this switch over here because it's going to turn on this and switch it from false to zero. So the NPV function over here will work. Okay, and then we now we put our actually invested capital in. That's if it's, it's false, if our post period is false, we just put the actual invested capital. If not, we go back one and multiply it by the growth rate. And this growth rate, I said, well, it, if, if it's the uh, post-explicit period switch, then put the growth rate in. Otherwise, just put zero. That doesn't really matter. And then you use your interpolation. And I go crazy. I don't know why in the hell nobody looks at this. I think it's so important to get an interpolation function and I think it's so criminal that Excel has no interpolation function in and rather than going through the whole thing I'm just going to remind you that if you go to my website edbodmer.com and you go to this Excel and VBA and you go up and look at the interpolate function you can go and find it and it says download the file so you download the file and then after you download the file uh, uh, there's there's actually a little switch. Oh no, this shows you how to use it, and this shows you how to copy that into your file, and this shows you the function itself. Actually, there's right now a button you can click, and it just says it allows you to to copy it all from the button. So I guess, I suppose I have to update that uh, page. Oh well. Okay, so that's our interpolation, and I already showed you the results, but since it's so important, I'll show you them again. We're going from 10% down gradually, and if you put the linear, you know, you'd have, this is a, you could have a, a linear interpolate or a, a, a compound one. And then we have the, the, the NOPAT, which is just the invested capital multiplied by the ROIC, that's not very hard. And then we have the increase in the invested capital, which is just this. Now, I have to tell you something else, just which I've been getting wrong. If you have invested capital in this year and in this year, so it grows by 5%. And then I put some EBITDA in, and I made the EBITDA also grow by 5%. And I put some depreciation in as 5% of the invested capital tax rate is on these are operating taxes then then we get our no pat is that okay it's just net operating profit after this taxes on the operations and our roic is the same so we could have started with eight percent roic multiplied it by invested capital got the 80 added the taxes and these together now what i'm showing you is not that i'm saying well what happened to our cash flow in this case our invested capital went up by 50, all right? But we had depreciation. So the actual amount we spend on CapEx plus working capital changes, I left working capital changes out of here. I'm just focusing on the depreciation for a minute. Our amount we spend was 102. So what happened here is, is and then if we look at our actual cash flow, we take our EBITDA, minus the taxes, minus the capex, and then we get a net 
cash flow of 34, but you could get this net cash flow from no pat minus the increase in invested capital. That's what I'm really trying to show you. So if you go back to the valuation page now, all right, and that we have an invested capital increase that I just showed you, then the no pat minus this invested capital increase uh, that's the the cash flow, okay? And it, I even said it over here in the title. And then once we have that cash flow, we need the terminal year, which comes from the stable amount. So let's go through here. Now let's go kind of to the cash flow right at the very, very bottom. This says if it's the... First, say if it's the switch for the NPV per per period, blah, blah, blah. So we get our zeros. Then we say, okay, then we'll take it. And then once you get that, you uh, uh, add the cash flow, this cash flow line. Maybe, I think maybe this is worth an underline. What do you think? Shift control E if you have generic macros open. Okay. So that's our cash flow. And that cash flow continues with the growth. It actually goes down a little bit because of the RIC minus the growth assumption. I don't know why. Well, that, And then at the very end, we say, no, okay, here, take the final year cash flow, use our final stable period, and get that number, and then take that NPV all the way back and that's going to take that's going to be like any explicit period it's going to take the npv all the way back here okay and then you get your terminal value all the way right at the very end this is your terminal value from this method and that's the one i just put up here so i don't have to put that up here anymore and we have that complicated and advanced case and the main thing i hope you see is how to think about it and then you can make a nice little summary uh, uh, with the explicit period and you could put those i should put the the spinner boxes here you know but why don't i turn off the video before i do that and you can you should show what your historic and forecasted roic is and then base case it's a lot worse and the value is uh, a, a lot worse okay and in the low case it really goes down so you'd say why would you continue operating the company and on and on and on okay and that's how that's some uh, uh, valuation analysis and those are some suggestions on how to set up the valuation and it's got some basic ideas and hopefully a little more advanced ideas and I finally finished this damn thing.